Welcome to the Vinny Rock Podcast. Podcast. I took the blow. The Vinny Rock Podcast. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's uh, Vincent Vargas, obviously, with the Vinny Rock Podcast. Uh, we just want to say thank you for everyone who's been supporting us and watching us, who's subscribed to our YouTube channel where you can watch the full length of our podcast. Uh, we're having a little bit of trouble with Spotify right now. We're working that out. We haven't uploaded probably the past five episodes, so that's just a pain in my ass that we're working on. Either way, just want to take this time to talk about several of my sponsors. You guys already know one of my main ones is Core Medical Group. I've been with Core Medical Group for about six years. Uh, they're outstanding. They work with a lot of the military and uh, veterans and special operations communities all around you, the people that you are near and dear to. Core Medical Group services them. Uh, it's one of the most important things men can do for their mental health is get their blood work checked yearly. So if you guys have any questions, hit me up about Core Medical Group. But uh, another one of my sponsors is GMR Gold and Bullion Box. GMR Gold is is a company that sells precious metals, gold and silver. Currently right now, you guys already know the trends. There's gold is through the roof right now and what, what, what the value is of it. Uh, I enjoy buying uh, my subscription-based model with the Bullion Box, monthly subscriptions coming to my house so me and the kids can enjoy opening it up and have some good times with it. I've obviously hit some before in the past. I'm gonna hit some more in the future, hide some more in the future so you guys can go enjoy doing a little bit of a treasure hunt because I enjoy doing things like that for y'all. Another one of our sponsors is Modern Gun School. It is an online, uh, from your own home, learn how to be an armor. Right, this school has all the certifications you need to be an armor. You can do this at the comfort of your own home. They take the GI Bill, they take the voc vocational rehab uh, um, benefit as well. So you guys have any questions, trust me, this is a really good company. Several of my close friends have used this and have been super proud of it and super excited about it. So if you guys are interested in being armors in the comfort of your own home, please go check them out. As well as Everest.com. Everest.com is a trading post for outdoor goods. If you guys are outdoorsmen, if you guys like to camp, hunt, fish you can find everything you need at everest.com go check them out we have several other sponsors coming on board here soon we're really excited about them i'll talk to you about those later on but right now we're just super excited about the growth of the podcast and we want to continue to grow this podcast so please like share subscribe to our youtube channel go check it out on itunes or wherever else you listen to podcasts thank you so much for being a guest or for being a fan and supporter of the vinnie rock podcast take care Welcome to the Vinny Rock Podcast. Got a new setup going on. I'm not liking this microphone. I'll probably change it before the next one. I have a guest today. Uh, we we don't barely barely know each other. We met online essentially. He what where I've seen you post for. Um, and what happened is after I wrote the book, you actually made a post talking about the book, and your correction was funny. But um, that's where I got more like, oh, what's this dude's this story? Um, and so Doc Askins uh, is here today with us. He came in from uh, Kentucky. It was pretty much last week. I said, why don't you come on in and do the podcast? So here we are. Doc, um, from what I've seen about you, you are in the medical field of some sort, as well as you focus a lot on the anti-hero's journey, your book, as well as a podcast. On top of that, uh, I've seen a lot of things about psychedelics, and so... Before we get into your story, um, I created a group company called Light the Fuse Wellness. I've shown you the videos. And in that effort was to combat suicide. But through some of the things I've studied, white paper studies and whatnot, um, I try and refrain from using the conversation of suicide and more so in the topic of resiliency, almost like the direction of mitigation. Uh, if I teach people how to live healthier lifestyles, they'll hopefully never get to the red line moment of terminal crisis, if you will. So that's kind of what I, what I created. So I thought it'd be really fascinating to have you in here and talk about everything that you have to talk about. And I'm just ready to learn. Okay. So this is like... Yeah. New conversation. I didn't want to talk to you when you came to my house. Let me just sit down. Let me set up this camera because I want to have all these questions and discussions open for the public to see so we can kind of have some dialogue. Um, but please first introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. I'm grateful 
that you'd have me down here and host me on the podcast here for sure. Um, ben Doc Askins. I like to go by Doc because it's confusing. Uh, I was a combat medic for a decade in the Kentucky Army National Guard. So everybody called me Doc. And, you know, there's whole years of my life where people call me Doc and whole years of my life where people call me Ben. But I'm not a doctor. I'm a physician assistant, which is a controversial thing where trying to figure out, you know, I have a medical license, but I'm not allowed to call myself a doctor, but my nickname is Doc. And that's sort of psychedelic all by itself. Right. <laughs> so I wind up working in the mental health field straight out of uh, I went to the inter-service physician assistant program. I was an oh, OK cool. enough combat medic that I got uh, selected to go down. I spent 16 months at Fort Sam Houston doing the didactic phase and then 13 months at Fort Campbell. Uh, working all over post there doing the second phase, which is all clinical rotations graduated in January of 2020. I started my medical career as a physician assistant, February of 2020, working in psychiatry, mental health. And, uh, you remember what happened, you know, March of 2020 COVID shut down the planet. Oh yeah. And then just changed everyone's plans. Yeah. So I had to call an audible and I want the, the private practice that my friend hired me into, Dr. Robert Stewart in Louisville, Kentucky, hired me straight out of school into a specialty, which is rare, uh, you know, for a physician assistant to be able to do. I was very fortunate to have him as a mentor because he was cutting edge. He was doing ketamine assisted therapy out of his private practice office starting back in 2017. Yeah. Now, some of the best papers supporting that were only published in about 2015. It was 2001 whenever they started to build some evidence in support of that. But he's on the cutting edge. I was really fortunate to just get to kind of cut my teeth learning from him how to do ketamine assisted therapy so at the office there under the covid pandemic there's tons of people who are acutely suicidal that we would have wanted to hospitalize but a hospitalization meant exposure to covid so it was a catch-22 what do we do i wound up managing my first year out of school a ton of acutely suicidal people outpatient using ketamine assisted therapy just you know, trial by fire, baptism by fire, trying to figure out how to do that. And, you know, we didn't lose anybody. Everybody uh, like ketamine works in a way that isn't fully understood yet medically for acute suicidality, unlike anything else. Um, so I was doing that work for about a year and a half. Can and I then stop got, you real quick and yeah, ask yeah. I have a question like, what is it that is, is it, you might not even have this answer. This might not even be a question for you, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, why is it that we seem to be facing more, not just veterans, not just law enforcement, but just people having suicide ideation more often now than ever? Is it the fact that we publicly talk about it more or is it more visually like in our face through social media, mainstream media? But that question is something I've always wondered. Is that something that you would even kind of have any kind of insight into? Yeah, so I could definitely try, right? Uh, one thing I didn't mention is after uh, deploying to Iraq in 2011, I came back and used my GI Bill to get a Master of Divinity degree from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary back in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky. Awesome. So uh, I have a medical license and I'm a Master of Divinity, whatever that you know cocky title means. <laughs> but I care a lot about trying to figure out the meaning of life and purpose and philosophy and some of that stuff in the book i do a bunch of like my own armchair philosophizing right. about that i have a chapter that's just all about anti-suicidality and why i think why i think we've gone off the rails on a bunch of that sort of stuff but i think it has to do with a loss of understanding our identity who we are in the first place and a loss of meaning and purpose in life and those two things are intimately interrelated and it's easy to say that but i think that we've become so unrooted and unmoored from having any direction in life other than like defining ourselves in terms of what we hate and who we're not like rather than knowing ourselves primarily and who we are in our identity and then living out of that identity in a meaningful way so like i say over and over again in the book think for yourself or not at all that's one of the mantras that i have in life is look i'm gonna think i'm gonna take in all the information let me go to seminary let me go to pa school let me go get postgraduate fellowship training in neuropsychiatry and genomics and uh, you know ma maps train multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies mdma assisted therapy for ptsd like i've got all the accolades and all of the stuff and whatever and like i just want to pull it all in and then try to figure out what the fuck do I actually think about each one of these sorts of things? So I think suicidality is on the rise because of the despair that comes from trying to find those answers outside of yourself and outside of healthy resources that are available. And like what's easily available is addictive. 
what's easily available is something that someone else is going to make a whole lot of money off of getting you hooked on, whether that's media, whether that's yeah. medicine, whether that's the dopamine dump of likes and shares. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all the ways that like, well, like, you know, you work in psyops, right? There's like a way to be pro-social about psyops and there's a way to be anti-social about psyops. And that's some of what, you know, like you're going to it's school a lot right what I now do. for, yeah, right? It's a lot yeah. what I focus on when I, when I construct messaging, even the blogs I put out. If you see me put time into something, it's because I actually have paid attention to how I deliver that message and making sure it's giving a positive, uh, you know, psychology, if, if I have to put a word to it, a positive influence rather than a kind of like a Debbie Downer influence. Yeah, exactly. Like, and they are two sides of the same coin. So that's a big part of kind of my approach to a lot of this is what's called integration therapy, which is a big buzzword in the psychedelic assisted therapy uh, world. But the idea with integration therapy is that you're going to take every aspect of your life, your story, your character, your personality, your experiences, and you're going to make sense of all of it. They talk about Shadow work is the way that it gets talked about in like the Jungian tradition coming out of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic theories where your shadow side is all the things that you want to deny about yourself. You don't want to admit that these things are true of me. So I stuff them down into my subconscious and I don't think about them. And yeah, I'm, I'm a good dude. I'm a good dude all the time. And the only reason I'm ever a bad dude is because of that asshole that cut me <laughs> off in traffic or whatever. Like it's his fault. And all that is, is taking your own shadow, projecting it onto somebody else and then being mad whenever you see your shadow over there right integration therapy is all about figuring out how to bring in everything about who you are all the good all the bad all the all the evil that you do make sense out of it so that you can be honest with yourself about who you are and then be better than who you were even just one percent better every day for a hundred days is a hundred percent better right so it's so funny man so when i started doing the mind thing the acting thing I, I kind of felt like well while i'm in la let me try and write a book i've been talking about tomorrow stuff that i'm going to write an actual book right i wrote two kids books that are like I don't know. It's probably a total of like 40 words. <laughs> nice. He's like, yeah, yeah, dad, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. But then I wrote a uh, light the fuse and light the fuse was really meant to kind of, uh, track and, and explain my transition. Right. But it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be just kind of like military heavy, but it was just like my, all my fuck ups and how I answered those fuck ups kind of thing. You know what I mean? And a lot of the things you're saying it like really resonates with me. And it kind of seems like, it, you know, when you, when you, when you go down the path of trying to figure shit out, it comes down to like self, self awareness and self identity and, yeah. and self accountability, right? Like <laughs> and when you were able to do that, you're like, Oh, I can learn a lot about myself. Yeah. And you start to have a lot of compassion for other people who haven't done that work. And that's the sort of thing that gives you an inroad to help them to start down that path. Like it's all interconnected in a whole bunch of ways. Right. Like we could talk about this individualistically, which is how we do it in America. But across the world, there are places where the culture, it's the norm to, you know, um, magnify the collective over the individual. And we're very individualistic here, which I think is something that also contributes to being atomized and being divided and being separated out from the communities Alienating around you. Ourselves. just kind of in the water. Yeah. Right. Whereas in more, quote unquote, Eastern cultures, there there might be a whole bunch of ways that you sacrifice who you are as an individual so that your family or your tribe yeah, or it's your like collective they does say well. It, it right? takes a tribe, right? They, you know, they say that same saying, but as well as, you know, I did some Native American sweat lodge, you know, and I did it, I did a veteran version of that. And essentially with the, with the, uh, the leader, right. The spiritual leader that day was talking about how the, in his tribe, uh, back when they would come back from war, they would wash their sins through in the ceremony. And we don't have that, right? Like as, as soldiers, uh, even law enforcement officers, we don't have a ceremonial uh, cleansing of our of our sins, if you will, or or the moral injury. We don't have that. They have a, soul, a whole ceremony just to f make you feel better about whatever you experienced. Now I got like chills while you're talking about that because <laughs> like, uh, have you read Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield? I, no, so, so many people yeah, tell yeah, me about yeah, the no, damn it's, book. It's a good one. I listen to it on audio book like once a year. I'll have, like, to, I'll have to listen or whatever. to it. Really, the GWAT is the first time, Vietnam to some degree, but the global war on terrorism is the first time that you could be like in a firefight one day and home the goddamn next day. <laughs> in the history of civilization, that was impossible. You're right, because right? they used to take boats and shit, right? Yeah, yeah. So like World War II, all those guys were on a boat for like a month, month and a half, just sharing stories, just talking about, remember that dumb shit Rudy did or you know, oh, whatever. Dude. Like they were, that's debriefing. That's critical incident stress debriefing. That's stuff that we like have to schedule in to demobilization now and nobody wants anything to do with it. Like when we came back from Iraq in December 2011, everybody just wanted to go 
go home for Christmas. So you're fucking lying your ass off about like, are you suicidal? <laughs> Fuck no. Absolutely you know, not. You, you drink yeah, a lot? No, like, no. Yeah, yeah. You just want to go home as fast as possible, right? But like you need that process. Like get, the reason I brought up Gates of Fire is because there's a whole section of that that's just about the way that you know, in ancient Sparta, they approached sitting around the fire together. Oh, beautiful. Telling all of these stories. The older soldiers, the older warriors would be talking to the younger warriors, both before and after battle. There was this preparation and integration, which is a big deal in psychedelic assisted therapy as we do a bunch of, you know, preparation for this medicine session where you're going to have a real intense, non-ordinary state of consciousness. And like you've read probably On Combat with Dave yeah. Grossman, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a non-ordinary state of consciousness. He ties it all to like heart rate, right? Your heart rate gets up over 200. You got auditory exclusion. You got tunnel vision. You got, you know, like all the blood shunts to your core. You're not going to bleed if you get hit in a you know limb wound, all of those sorts of things. That's a non-ordinary state of consciousness that most civilians don't think about. Most people who I'm talking to in psychedelic assisted therapy don't think of it in those terms. But you eat like a whole bunch of mushrooms or you take a ketamine assisted therapy session at one of my clinics or whatever. And you're going to get into this other state of consciousness as well. So you need preparation before you do that and you need to integrate it afterwards. And we've lost that completely yeah. from the military whenever we send people overseas. Like you can deploy as an individual a return as an individual and nobody knows you left nobody knows you came back and nobody gave a fuck the whole time yeah i'll make i'll give you an example dude so in 2005 we were in mosul obviously one of the busiest times 2005 mosul was fucking hot and heavy man we had we had a lot of uh, a lot of action in that in that deployment and then i took off about a couple weeks early because my daughter was being born and so we took a flight from mosul to another base i think it was uh, chapman and all night we're getting fucking rocketed dude i'm like great i'm gonna get killed before i go see my daughter i right. left fucking right. combat right. i showed up yeah. to fucking and, and then just, the yeah just home. right and then the next day i'm in spain and from spain i'm, I'm fucking in, in washington dc and then a flight home and i'm home within within a two days of getting rocketed in a fucking car and no like and that was impossible before now because of the technology that's available yeah. to us which is a blessing and a curse it has a shadow side and a positive side to it too right like the ability to get helicopters to point of wounding to evacuate people we got lots of people who are surviving the sorts of wounds that would have died in vietnam but now they're living on prosthetics for the rest of their lives and all of the you know the care that's around those sorts of things going on. Like there's a bunch of ways that technology has significantly improved our ability to do combat and our ability to do combat casualty care. And it's also impeded us from doing really good mental health care because of not being able to adapt what, you know, like we're essentially like overgrown monkeys, yeah. <laughs> but we're able to like travel 50, you know, like time zones away and come back overnight we haven't adapted the ways that we find meaning and purpose and identity to the ways that we can change our setting and our mindset and those sorts of things. So do me a favor. I know you wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. Anti-Hero's Journey. First, explain to me the title, like why you named it that. Okay, I'm just going to read like the backside. Please. It'll, it'll make sense. Are you familiar with the hero's journey? Yes. Concept? Like at this point, it's everywhere, right? Like it's in Star Wars and Lord right. of the Rings. And it's really big in psychedelic assisted therapy. It's the hero's, the hero's journey. journey. Yeah. Got it. It's a way of making sense of having a difficult trip with a psychedelic is like you, yeah, go, you go out and you come back and you're the hero and now you have gifts to bestow or whatever so like joseph campbell famously described the pattern embedded in every good story from ancient mythology to science fiction as the hero's journey the monomyth quote a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder fabulous forces are encountered and a decisive victory is won the hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man, the hero with a thousand faces. The hero's journey is a fantastic children's story. Alternatively, this book is for adults only. When you are ready to see the pattern of reality inscribed on the bottom of every story, anti-hero's journey offers the zero myth. A zero ventures further than a hero. Beyond the illusions of supernatural wonder, beyond fabulous forces, beyond decisive victory, never returning from a mysterious adventure, unknowing everything untrue. There are no powers, no boons, no fellow man. The zero has nothing, gives nothing, takes nothing, is nothing. The hero is all illusion. All reality is zero. The zero with a thousand faces. 
<laughs> Give me one of those copies, dude. Give what, me one of those what copies. Language <laughs> non standard motherfucker. <laughs> I love it, man. Do me a favor. Would you want to read it's, an ex- excerpt from yeah, your yeah. book? It's 150 pages with oh, pictures. Oh, this is an e- easy know? read. Like it's an yeah, easy read. it's an easy read. So it would appear. So, yeah, exactly. So it appears you're really intelligent. Like, oh, shit, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say up front, like for anybody that wants to listen to the audio book or read the book or whatever, uh, chapter zero is intended to be like a psychedelic mind opening chapter. You got to get through it. You got to climb the ladder to ride the slide. Don't tap out at chapter zero. Like it's all good <laughs> stories after that. But I've had friends who are like, man, I don't, I don't want to read this. Like chapter zero feels like homework or something. Like, <laughs> just suck it up and read like 10 pages. <laughs> Fucking A it. guy. Yeah, exactly. Do work, son. Uh, all right. So I was telling you before, uh, the main part of this story happened 12 years ago today uh, to me in Iraq. My second daughter was born on Father's Day while I was deployed of all the unreal, heartstring-tugging stories. My wife already had a miscarriage the previous year while I was away at WLC, the Warrior Leader course. I was the distinguished honor graduate while she lost a baby at home alone on the toilet. Now she's delivering our second born in a hospital without me. Who's the real American hero? Shortly after delivery, our daughter had respiratory difficulties and was rushed by ambulance to the children's hospital with the best neonatal intensive care unit, NICU, in the area, Cosair Children's Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. My wife sent a Red Cross message to my unit to let them know about our daughter's status so that I could be released to go home on emergency leave. She called me to tell me what had happened, and I told her I needed to call her back. Now, this is the part of the story where every civilian looks at me like I have two heads and both are stupid. And it's the part of the story where every veteran understands the dilemma, even if they'd make a different decision. It's where my two so-called heroes journeys at the time collided. Go home and be the hero husband slash dad or stay with your unit and be the hero medic slash sergeant. Life and death are happening everywhere, all the time, and there's always some poor bastard stuck in the middle. I didn't know which to choose. A pastor friend called and convinced me that my family needed me more than Uncle Sam for once. I agreed and got on a plane home. The real truth is that I'm no hero, and both my unit and my family could get along just fine without me. It'd be years before I could unsee enough untruth to realize that, though. Six days. The Bible says God made the earth in six days, then he rested. Lucky. I got to be home with my wife and two little girls for six days. Then I went back to war. Our daughter is a little fighter, tough like her mama. So she healed up quickly and got out of the NICU in six days. I was on the way back to my unit before she even made it home. I missed seeing her meet her big sister for the first time. But my wife mailed a photo that moment to me. I kept it on the wall in the shipping container in the desert where I lived for the next few months. I gave them a kiss every day on my way out the door. A couple months after I got back to the unit, they sent me to fill in with another company on one of the base entry control points. They put me up on a tower with a rifle and an overwatch position, which wasn't the norm for me as a medic, but several troops who started the day there went down with a bad case of viral gastroenteritis. Every Marine a rifleman, so they say. Of course, I was neither a Marine nor a rifleman, but at least I wasn't shitting all over myself that day, so I'd have to do The virus was making its way through practically everyone on base at the time. They were already short staffed and the troops did and the troops they did have were making frequent and lengthy trips to the porter shitters. I'm trying to keep an eye on the far end of the gate while passing out anti diarrhea meds like their Pez. Intelligence reports that week had mentioned the adoption of a new enemy tactic in nearby regions. Military aged males had been wearing suicide vests under head to toe burqas or niqabs, the traditional dresses, which famously cover virtually every inch of female skin in the most fundamentalist parts of the Islamic world. These guys dressed up like women and acted like they needed medical assistance, which would draw in a few of us chivalrous American heroes. Then the dude would clack himself off, maim or kill a few soldiers, and go off to be with his coterie of perpetual virgins in the particularly ridiculous version of an afterlife that his recruiter had sold him. Shitty theology, effective tactics, despicably impressive. 
So I was a bit caught off guard when a woman wearing a hijab, which is just a headscarf, while carrying a swaddled baby, appeared out of nowhere, already inside several layers of our security. Where the hell did she come from? Wasn't anyone watching the entry point out there? Where were the guards? Were those guys all in the shitter? Is anyone else seeing this? She had to have walked past several points where someone should have stopped her. She would have also walked past multiple signs in multiple languages telling her that she would be shot if she continued past them. Can't she read? Is she lost? Had she sneaked in a different way? Is she limping? Is something wrong with her baby? Is she an insurgent or a civilian? Why the fuck is she in here where she doesn't belong? Why the fuck am I up here where I don't belong? Since she was wearing a headscarf and not a full face and head covering like we'd been warned, I was able to see that she was clearly not a military-aged male. In fact, through the magnification of the rifle's optics, I could see that she had some of the most strikingly beautiful feminine features I'd ever seen. Through the reticles of the round scope, she looked like one of the icons of the virgin and child that you often see in a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox church or Protestant churches at Christmas. That's why I've thought of her as the Virgin Mary ever since. Soldiers down below were yelling at her to stop, but she just kept walking. Not running, just walking, relentless, determined, unyielding, moving forward. She just kept fucking going. The rules of engagement say to engage at this point. Intel says to watch out for dudes in dresses, but she's clearly a lady with a child. Life and death are happening everywhere all the time, and there's always some poor bastard stuck in the middle. Still not being much of a marksman, as with my little brother in the pool cue, I aimed for her eye but hit her in the cheek. After the few days I had with my newborn in the hospital, kissing her photo every day as I walked out my door, I just really didn't want to aim for center mass and possibly shoot the baby in her arms. As it turns out, Either the intel guys had gotten their info wrong or the enemy had changed tactics. Probably both. Maybe neither. The baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, was a jar full of nails and screws and other makeshift shrapnel. Mary had been suited up with a suicide vest like a walking claymore mine. Not that I knew any of that when I pulled the trigger. Shooting her in the face instead of the chest might have saved some lives that day, or so I was told anyway by very serious people fast forward through about a decade and a half of hyper vigilance at playgrounds full of mothers with babies and annually drinking my way through christmas time with nativity images plastered everywhere and i am right back in that goddamn desert mary gets up off the ground and approaches me her face is whole and beautiful again not like I'd made it. She's not angry. She doesn't want revenge. She isn't waiting on the other side to ambush me with all her friends. She tells me things I haven't had the courage to believe or the wisdom to see for myself. The Virgin tells me she didn't want to be there that day any more than I did. She forgives me for something I always thought unforgivable. She says she'll be glad to see me when I get to the other side with her, and she loves me. Somehow, she loves me. And I find that I love her too. She's okay, and I'm okay. I'm crying hard, but I'm also the most okay I've ever been. Everything's okay in the end, she says. You don't expect your 13-year-old daughter to be anything other than than who she is. So you can't expect a 13 billion year old universe to be anything other than what it is. Both are pure beauty and pure mystery, one in the same. I take off the eye mask and pull off the headphones. I was in what psychedelic assisted psychotherapists call a non-ordinary state of consciousness while doing a very intense holotropic breathwork session. It was definitely just holotropic breathwork and emphatically not 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine or MDMA. Definitely not that. That would be illegal. Definitely just breathwork. I'd never do anything illegal, not even to save my own life. 
Assisting me through this therapy session with tears in his eyes is my new best friend, a physician, pilot, entrepreneur, millionaire, Dr. Luke Murray, founder of Awesome Inc. in Lexington, Kentucky. He's under my left arm now, and under my right arm, wiping tears from her face, is his co-therapist, the CEO of a large medical company, and the winner of the Miss Kentucky pageant in 2019, Jordan Whiter. We live in a simulation. The Virgin Mary, the ghost haunting that stack in my memory library, gave me a message and exited through the gift shop. It happened on Veterans Day last year, which happens to be the day after my father's birthday. That morning, while I was waiting for a ride to this session, I received a text from an old friend about one of the young troops from our old unit dying by suicide. He didn't have a memory. His memory had him. But my memories don't have me anymore, and I don't have them either. I'm nothing. Knowing that I'm nothing, I spent the rest of the day falling in love with my wife all over again. Like back when I was a virgin, she's just perfect enough that she could almost trick me into going back to sleep in the dream world with her. The perfect wife and the perfect kids are almost enough to make me stop at oneness rather than driving all the way to zero. But then I'd have to change the name of the book and that shit's just not going to happen. <clears throat> Damn. That was heavy. It's beautiful. Yeah. I, uh, I had no intention of ever talking about that story ever anywhere. Right. Yeah. And now I wrote a book and like, I'm here talking to you about it. Cause, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy. Yeah. <sighs> Crazy. Um, so the scenario you explained obviously happened, but the aftermath of that was during a assisted therapy. You yeah, got kind to of blend the you, two together yeah, in the chapter there. You, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I got it. Yeah. I understood. <laughs> and I'm trying to help any of the listeners understand that during your, your assisted therapy, you were able to find closure or acceptance exactly. of that Yeah, because you were able to talk to the individuals as well as internally except what happened is what happened. Yeah. It, the memory of talking to her in that space feels just as real as the memory of being in Iraq 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like the memories feel healed right. completely. A good friend of mine, uh, Matt Larson, uh, combatives instructor, right? Good, good yeah, buddy. You were telling me about him yeah. on my podcast. Yeah. 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 So he's uh, he has his doctorate in psychology and all that stuff now, but he focuses a lot on moral injury right. and you know, and I feel in, in recent times, we kind of get confused on what is post-traumatic stress and what is moral injury. And I, and I think, you know, your, your particular incident seems like more of like a moral injury, right? Because too many of those things were too close to home, but also your morals and values of a man and maybe how you were raised to ever engage on a woman is like, what the fuck would you ever do that? And having to pull that trigger as well as having the idea that she had a baby in her hands and also being so closely related to when you just saw your daughter being born too many connections, right? Too many mental connections that was all abruptly changed. Yeah. And that is probably the number one thing I have dealt with in my career and as well as working with veterans is, is I tell my wife, I say, I expected to go to combat. I expected people were going to get killed, even us, right? Both sides. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect it to be so confusing on who was the enemy. Yeah. And I didn't expect the collateral damage that happens in war. And I say collateral damage, it's kind of a very, um, I guess, almost heartless term. Um, innocent bystanders being killed due to combat practice, right. you know? Uh, and I think that was what caught me off guard the most. You know, there was there was an incident happened overseas. I don't talk about it too often in this in, in detail, but you know, there was an incident where these males um, essentially were trying to ambush us, and their family was in the vehicle at the same time. You know, they use their family as shields. The the in in there was a there was some kind of study that came out talking about how they, it was intentional for them to do that because they knew psychologically they'd be destroying us. You know. And that's a lot what's happened is a lot of our brothers and sisters who went to combat and had scenarios such as yours and similar to that um, has not been able to digest that has not been. They have not been able to accept uh, that 
war is ugly, you know, and as much as we have rules in war, not everyone does. <laughs> right, right. You know, right. and so since we have rules and we have morals and values as human beings and how we're raised and and ideologies and not everyone plays that same game, you know, um, I don't think we expected to come home with all the baggage and, and we weren't taught how to manage it either. Yeah. What you and I know what was taught was drink. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Camaraderie, brotherhood, drink, d dark humor. Raw, raw, raw. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's all toxic. Like it's, <laughs> it's terrible. Alcohol is a literal neurotoxin. It is a the literal fucking worst toxin. Right? I can't yeah. get people to understand that. Like trying to tell someone like, Hey man, you should probably stop drinking is the most effective. But I'll say this. I too was the guy that said, I don't trust a motherfucker who doesn't drink. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were saying, I was saying to you offline, like, like last year on this anniversary that like this was 12 years ago today that happened to me in Iraq. <laughs> last year was the first year I was sober on December 5th. Yeah. Right. Like I, I was going to drink that memory away every I year. That was how I was going to celebrate, so you know, crazy. being a piece of shit was I, like slowly killing myself with alcohol. Right. Yeah. I wasn't going to pull the trigger and do it quick, but I wasn't real happy with myself. Didn't like myself. Yeah. I explained that. I explained it to people as in like, um, the the way I had it, the way I did it in my head, and I'm 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 assuming it's very similar to what you did was that day. So the anniversary date of my 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 friends uh, who were killed overseas. It was uh, Sergeant Bras and Sergeant Brem. I talk about them often because they were just, you know, they were huge impact in my life, right? And their death really really did a number on me. But on the anniversary date of their death, I would drink, and it was my my mentality of it. Now that I can kind of pieces together was I wanted to cause pain to myself to show them how much I love them. I wanted to hurt myself so bad and, and, and destroy my own self to show them how hurt I am for their loss. And, and I, and so the only way I could explain is like the, the, it's stu it's the dumbest thought. Yeah, it's process. the psychology of self harm, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. But, but the only way I was able to kind of I got tired of watching all of our platoon. You hear, oh yeah, he got arrested that night. Yeah, he got DUI that night. The same night. That night was like with the catalyst for probably like 20 dudes getting DUIs or arrested by the cops or whatever the fuck, yeah. right? Stupid yeah, shit. Yeah. And I sat there and thought, at the same time, I'm, 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 I'm struggling with my own identity with God. Me and him are still figuring it out, you know, in the yeah, sense, yeah. right? Me and, too. You're right. And so I was like, there's no way if there is a heaven, there's no way they're looking down saying, fuck yeah, drink another shot. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. They got to have some perspective from right. up there, right? There's no yeah, way yeah. up there they're saying, do it, drink more. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. In my head, then I, then I start thinking like, you know, but what would they say? Hmm. Well, they'd say, fuck, dude, don't waste this shit, bro. Yeah, yeah. Don't waste this opportunity. And that's what pivoted my mind originally was like, okay, well, that day, just don't drink for sure that day because I was still drinking, yeah. but I knew that day was like a, a catalyst for worse version of me. And so I was like, just don't do it that day at least. And that was some of what I felt was like the message that I received from the medicine session or whatever, right? Was like what I felt like I'd done was unforgivable. Like if you commit the unforgivable sin, like you can expect some version of hell after this life. So you might as well get used to it. You might as well yeah. adopt a position here where you're just going to destroy yourself. Get ready. Right, you're gonna you're going to hell anyways. You might as well, yeah, might as well exist in your own. See hell, I'll show you hell or whatever, you know. Uh, but I felt like I got this message, like that everything's okay in the end. Yeah, and that I can back plan, you know, like begin with the end in mind is one of the seven habits of highly effective people or whatever. And he didn't mean like the heat death of the universe or your own death or whatever. But that's where I go to with that is like, okay, if everything's okay in the end, if I know that, how do I live in between now and knowing mm -hmm. everything's going to be okay in the end? That's the message that I felt like I got from God, from, from the, whatever source, the from, medicine, yeah, right? From yeah, exactly. What's well, interesting? We're gonna have to talk more about that medicine uh, uh, later. But can, can I say something about moral injury? Because you yeah, brought that up earlier, I would love it. and uh, you know, like there's a progression of figuring out how to deal with the fallout from, especially modern warfare, right? Like ancient warfare, where you're like beating somebody to death with a stick or a spear or whatever like that takes it out of you you can only kill so many people that way in a day where like you can kill thousands of people with the technology that we have with your thumbs right it's a big step up from you know uh the 19th century warfare to 20th century warfare and what we, we they called it shell shock back in the day right and it was seen as sort of tantamount to cowardice it was like the red badge of courage sort of thing like if you didn't get hurt in war and you got to go to the rear 
you're a piece of shit, right? And it's developed some, but there's still tons of stigma around that. And a ton of like the symptoms of what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder are just autonomic nervous system stuff, like from being in a toxic environment emotionally rather than, you know, like a a gas chamber situation, like literally or whatever, that's going to wire up your nervous system in a different way so that, yeah, now you have triggers. Now you're at a playground and it's the safest place in the world and you're on high alert because of a situation where there's a, it's like a situational mismatch, right? Like they talk about people drowning, uh, the first time that they go scuba diving because they're not used to having a regulator in their mouth and every other environment except underwater, when you panic and you need to breathe, you got to get shit out of your mouth. But the one time that that's not okay, is when you're scuba diving and you need that regulator in, but people drown, it's a mismatch between your nervous system and your environment. Same sort of thing with true diagnosable PTSD, right? But I do think that like distinguishing moral injury and PTSD from each other entirely doesn't make sense. I think for a lot of people, like we call it phenotypes in medicine, like there's different ways that depression shows up. Yes. Symptom constellation. There's different ways that PTSD shows up and it meets the diagnostic criteria, but it's unique to you and the way that you carry those traumatic memories. So for a lot of guys who've seen a lot of shit that didn't bother them Mm -hmm. and then get put into a situation where it feels like the whole universe conspired against me to put me in an awful place that's morally injurious and then you have these autonomic nervous system you know secondary uh issues to some of that sort of stuff that build up right sometimes that overlaps sometimes somebody can have like a moral injury and not a whole lot of ptsd symptoms sometimes it's all ptsd symptoms with sometimes sometimes it's both moral injury but it's like a venn diagram right but there's overlap there right but i do think the future of understanding what exactly what the fuck is going on in somebody's brain that makes them respond in these sorts of ways after having been in those toxic environments is uh, a whole lot more research needs to be done around what exactly are the effects of moral injury on yeah. people. That's kind of the kernel of a lot of the, the GWAT bets that I'm talking to. Yeah. Is there's this moral injury that's kind of the center trauma, right? Like mm-hmm. there's this one thing mm-hmm. that's in a network in somebody's memory vault or whatever. And if they get into a, like a medicine session, they hit that index trauma is what I call it yeah. like right off the bat. And it could be anything. Could have been my dad beat the fuck out of me when I was a kid. Right. Could be like I almost drowned in like my car flipped right. over and went out. whatever the index trauma for you is is whatever it is but then there's like this network of other traumas that are all just kind of tied in mm-hmm. together over and over again in uh, in sessions people will hit that index trauma from a place of like strength and compassion and distance and then they just work their way out through this network of like oh and this other crazy thing happened and oh my uncle did this thing and, oh my yeah. god like all this stuff happened and so there's like one underlining just, event and it's like dominoes falling down after they go near that one morally injurious event the one thing that was the worst day of my life the worst mm-hmm. thing ever as soon as they make sense of it they're able to make sense of all of these other things that were all kind of triggers or that were all kind of interrelated yeah. in like a spider web or whatever. And it's like clearing all the trauma cobwebs out at once as soon as you hit that like master index trauma. So, so the way I, I say this, so a lot of guys come to me, obviously I'm not a doc by any means. I'm a guy who's just done a lot of modalities of healing and kind of direct traffic for people, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a connector. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as well as I can explain, I can probably put the words better than what, what people, because I put my own stuff to words, right? And so people hit me up, they go, oh man, I got these demons, right? Yeah. And so I always tell them, like, you're giving a blanket statement with demons. Yeah. Name it, claim it, tame it, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a book, that called sure. name it, claim it, tame it. And that's just an easier version of like, tell me the most significant fucking issue you're dealing with now. Yeah. And then we'll address that first. Yeah, yeah. And then we can start chomping out the other stuff, right? Yeah, and yeah. so it's like drinking. Okay, if you fix your drinking, maybe it'll fix your relationship. Maybe it'll fix your finances. Maybe it'll fix, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. Ident- name it, claim it, tame it. Like, find exactly what that one thing is first. Besides, besides, because when you give something like my demons, you're giving it a very broad blanket that is hard to understand and define. Yeah. And then at least like bring it s- smaller. You're giving it like an otherworldly <laughs> thing too, right? Like it's clearly <laughs> right. Or like it's impossible it's to like, fix, right? I don't even want to look at it right. or deal with it. It's a demon. It's terrifying, and that's a ton of like prep work for psychedelic assisted 
assisted therapy is similar to like uh, you know responding to an emergency. Go straight at that shit. Yeah. You see a demon, like you could maybe see a literal demon in a psychedelic assisted yeah. therapy session. The, the scariest thing that your psyche can imagine for you, it will imagine for you sometimes. Oh, fuck. For a good reason. That's scary. And then the the prep work is go straight at that motherfucker and ask it what it's doing there because it has something oh, to teach you. God, right. Dude. You want to hear a story about that? Please, dude. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm terrified just you thinking uh, like like oh. I had a, a psychedelic assisted therapy session where I felt like I died. Like people call it like the K-hole when you get like too much ketamine or whatever, you get like stuck okay, or whatever. Like you're just locked in and you're, you're scaring me. We live here now in hell, right? Like, and, uh, <laughs> I, we're like in your head, you really thought like, okay, yeah, I fucked up too I'm much. I'm sitting in a chair oh and I, you know, like with therapists and stuff, but like, I can't speak and I'm locked in and I felt like I died every single death for the last 13 billion years that were necessary for someone to have died in order for me to have the life that I was living sitting in that chair, lost complete connection with the fact that I was in the chair in the first place. And I have literal memories of being murdered over and over and over again from like demons, from monsters. I got my head cut off. I got disemboweled. I got burned alive. I got choked. I got whatever. I thought I died. I thought I went to hell. I thought I live here now. But yeah, that would be my version of hell. It's like, oh, wake up and then do <laughs> yeah. it again. It's yeah, it's like just get recycled just get over and over, and over again. So like, I have a uh, like, I have like a whole like Deadpool connection or whatever in like yeah, my that. like uh, like my brand or whatever. Um, Is that because of that? And that was the the connection was like that character right, yeah. in the comic books or in the movies or whatever. Like he feels everything when he gets pulled apart and then has to regenerate and grow back and yeah. whatever. But like his way of navigating that is humor. And that was where I got to in that space was like, I guess I fucking live here now. I'm going to live in hell forever. And I started cracking wow. jokes. Like a demon would come out of nowhere and like run me through with a sword. And I'd be like, real fucking original. Didn't we do this two million years ago? Or they'd be like choking me to death. I'd be like, yeah, that, oh, oh, that hurts. I guess we'll do this again. See you like at 10 a.m. Like I'd just be cracking jokes while these demons are killing me and then as soon as I started to be able to like find humor in like the worst imaginable scenario like my psyche or whatever I don't know did I travel to another dimension did I go to hell who the fuck knows but my psyche made this horrible series of events for me to figure out that as soon as I started to find like the lighter side, be able to joke around about it. It wasn't going to traumatize me as much anymore. And then I got to the other side of it and I moved into the next Bro, chapter you know of that experience. Bro, fucking odd this is, dog, because I just told you, I just wrote a paper for my psychology master's on Groundhog's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's exactly, exactly like that. that. Yes, so yeah, yeah. Blown away yeah, yeah. Really so like as soon as he got it right, as soon as Bill Murray got it right, yes. he got the fuck out and got to live his life. Right. That was where I got to. It was like, it was like Groundhog Day, but it was rated NC-17 because I was a <laughs> fuck fuck murder. Murder, you know, like, yeah, just torn apart over and over again. And then uh, like I shifted from that experience into, so it was like I went from uh, – hell to earth yeah so when you go through pa school especially in the military's pa school like it's inner service physician assistant program is no fucking joke <laughs> like it's like being jumped into an academic gang they're just like exams are on monday and friday here's nine thousand slides and ten thousand pages to read and good luck or whatever and you just kind of hack your way through it like you find your tribe you have your like study group or whatever and you get through all of that stuff and then in the clinical rotation year you get to rotate through and shadow all the specialists. So I'm yeah. doing general surgery. I'm doing urology. I'm doing dermatology. I'm doing, uh, you know, oncology and emergency room. And just every one of the specialties, you get the chance to kind of roll through and shadow them and see patients um, everywhere. Even though you get primary care education, just kind of general medical education, you can yeah. kind of pick after that. Um, I felt like I moved from in this like psychedelic assisted therapy setting from hell, where I was getting killed for 13 billion fucking years. <laughs> Straight into Earth, where immediately I became a 90-year-old man who was dying <coughs> from colon cancer. I was bleeding oh, from the wow. rectum, and I'm sitting shotgun in a car, and I'm just in pain. Like, And I was like, but this is way less pain than like the last 13 billion years. So it was kind of a relief. I was like, oh, I guess I'm just going to die of being old or something. Like, that'd be really cool. And I look into the driver's seat, and when I make eye contact with the person driving, I become the person driving. And I'm the 50-year-old son of the 90-year-old man who's, who's dying, right? And the 50-year-old son is like, 
oh man, I don't want my dad to die. Like, I got to find the guy. And the whole thing is like, I got to find the specialist, the guy who's going to save my dad's life, the medical yeah. specialist, which is like my career, my calling, right. or whatever, right? And I get into the emergency room and I make eye contact with the specialist, the, a surgical oncologist who's going to go in and maybe like save, save my dad's it's life. As soon as I make eye contact with him, I become that guy. Now you feel his empathy. And he's just a fucking guy. He's like, he's the best surgical oncologist in the world. He's fucking Peter Atia back in his like eight right. or whatever. He's right. house from the fucking TV show. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like he's, he's, everybody wants to see this guy. And then the stress of being the guy, he's got a bleeding ulcer himself, right? He's just a human oh being. God. His wife wants to leave him because he's Dude, working too many hours, up. all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And he's like, oh man, like this guy's 90 fucking years old. Like he's, he should have been dead 10 years ago anyway. Like he He's all out of empathy. He's fucking burned the fuck out. He wa- he doesn't love his life at all. And then, like, he saves the day, though, right? Goes in there, does right. surgery, saves the guy, and then, like, goes back to his fucking office and drinks a shot and just wishes he was fucking dead, too. Right. As soon as that's over, right back into being another patient with another, like, now I've got bone cancer. I oh need to, like, God. go see whatever. And I just work through, like, every one of the surgical specialties over and over and over again. And then through, like, all the medical specialties. And it's all just... Somebody dying, a family member that doesn't want them to die. Every time I make eye contact, I shift to the other one. And then I get to the specialist, and the specialist is just a person. Which is some of like the anti-hero's journey thing. Is like, there aren't any actual heroes. We're just people. We're all just trying to get by. Like, you want to go see the guy. You want to talk to the man. The man behind the curtain. No, the real one. No, the guy that's pulling all the strings. Like, whoever's behind the Illuminati the, or whatever, like boss, conspiracy bro. theory. Yeah, the we boss. want to meet the wizard or whatever. And the wizard is just another fucking person who's got their own problems and their oh, own struggles and their own whatever. God. And, like... Like, I was in the situation. That was a trip. This I, all- yeah, this was all in the trip. I was getting scoped a bunch, like, doing GI scopes yeah. and, you know, colonoscopies and stuff. And uh, they said, like, I don't remember it, but, like, I was saying stuff like, I just don't want to do any more of the butt stuff or the throat stuff. No more of the butt stuff or the throat <laughs> stuff. I want to do, like, the brain stuff. I want to do, like, the soul stuff. I, wanna, I wanted to go back to, like, like psychiatry stuff, yeah. where I do my practice currently. But I wanted to get to, like, that because that... It didn't involve like sticking something inside of somebody yeah. like, bleeding to death or whatever, right? Um, and I got to the other side of that to like when I realized there is no guy, like I gave up on trying to find the guy. Yeah, I was like, oh, I guess like everyone said there everyone's is no guy. It's it's yeah. zero with a thousand faces on or whatever, right? Everyone's looking for the hero with a thousand faces. There isn't one. It's the zero with a thousand faces. Yeah. Then I I got sent to heaven, which was like this whole other. Crazy thing, do you want to hear about heaven? Let me ask something. <laughs> I, I want to like, oh, run on yeah, or whatever. no, yeah. you're good. It's it's fascinating that these these assisted therapies, you know, take you through these phases. But I'm curious, just on the aspect of faith, as someone who who has a degree in this as well, um, does it take you further from the Christianity side? Was it Christianity is what you were learning? Yeah, yeah. And does it take you further from that, or does it further solidify it? So, God, that's such a hard question yeah. for me to answer. I love it. Uh, just, just it's what's your question. truth of that, yeah, I guess. Exactly. So my take on it at this point is extremely provisional, right? Like, I, it's a mystery, right? Yeah. That's the point of religion and to some degree in the first place is the li- life and the universe is immensely mysterious. And there are ways to believe in any religion that honors the fact that there's a mystery at the heart of it. Yeah. And then there's ways to believe that's just all about rules or all about why I'm right <coughs> and you're wrong and we should kill each other over it. You know? Yeah. Like, Does it make you feel slightly uncomfortable that you, your thought of it is turning your back on Christ? So I don't, turn my back on Christ. Right. Like I still believe in Christ, but it's in a very personal way that yeah. honestly isn't going to make a whole lot of sense to anybody else. <laughs> even if I try to explain it. And here's the thing. I giggle I because I, that I, it's true for everybody. I giggle because I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. I giggle because I think as soon as you talk to somebody, they'll be with you. They'll be like, like all those guys that have all these fucking rules about exactly who Jesus was. And that's what we all have to believe together. Or we go to hell. I'll tell you this might be the minority. Whenever you start to like compare notes, everybody's like, yeah, the further you dig into, the theology and like I guess how we self um, understand God I start to really believe that maybe God is so 
vast and overwhelming that we made a digestible version of God. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? I think, I think, and I said, I think, you know, I think humans probably aren't capable of really understanding what God is mm-hmm. and even putting a definition to it. Right. It's almost like, yeah. because you hear people going deep yes. into like, and they say these beings, right? Like, I, I think we've had to make it digestible so that we can say, okay, there is a higher power. Yeah. And what's scary is then like all these different versions of gods across the yes. nations, yeah, across yeah. the world. Yeah. You know? And, and I think the, the underlying thing is if you, if you do breath, even breath work or meditation, right? If you get deep enough into it, like you start finding like, there's definitely a higher power, you know? What I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. And we're definitely, I'm not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And we're definitely connected. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. that is even more like, you know, I've been writing another book currently because I'm like, I did the whole border patrol book, which makes me go deeper into my, my heritage and, and life. And then I started to, yeah. I, I raised the question to a, to a, a thought leader, uh, a, a friend of mine, a mentor. And I said, what happens if we all had the same skin color or no skin color? Right. Then we'd find another reason to fight. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's, how, that's how it is. I call it, uh, you know, like there's a bunch of ways of talking about this. And in the book, I try to make it like as fucking You're grunt right. level simple as yeah. I possibly can, right? Yeah. I call it a two, one, and zero. These are the ways that you can look at life. You can look at life from a dualistic way in which everything is separated out and individ- individualistic. So you and I are different. And I focus on how all the ways that we're different, right? Like we're Christians, but are you like 12th century Orthodox or Roman Catholic split? Or are you Western, you know, 16th century Protestant and Catholic split? Or are you one of the 39,000? I'm not sure what happened. I guess it came from like what I was saying is like if we had all the same skin color, we would find something new to argue. Right, right. And I was talking about um, two, one, zero, right? right? At like level two or circle two or whatever, you find all the differences. You separate everything out. You just divide, 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 divide all the way down. That's kind of what we do now, it seems like, right? What society currently does, like, you're either left or right. Hyper divisive, yeah. hyper dualistic. Right. Yeah. Liberal, yeah. Liberal. Red or blue, you know, right. like, yeah, all of those ways that you're different from me. And those are the things that really fucking matter. Can you come to my birthday party or not? Depends on all of this sort of bullshit or are whatever. You my right? friend or hers. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just define yourself in terms of all the things that you're not. Um, in Christian tradition, they call that. There's a the cataphatic way and the apophatic way of talking about God. Cataphatic is like all these things that you can say God is, and then apophatic is all these things that you can say God is not, and you, God's a mystery. So it's just all these negative ways of saying He's not limited, He's not small, He's not all of those sorts of things, right? So two is all about finding the differences and maximizing those and fucking killing each other over them. Right? Like that's the history of religious warfare is like your Jesus and my Jesus. My, not Je- my Jesus enough, says this. And mine will kick the shit out of yours. <laughs> and you know, like, Oh, I thought this was supposed to be all about love. Well, you don't love the way that I say yeah. you should love or whatever. Right. It seems like there's all these like enlightened people who start a religion at some point, And then like in the next generation, everybody's like, that guy, he had it right, and he said to love exactly this way and fuck everybody that says otherwise yeah. or whatever, It's right? the telephone game, bro. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, at level one, whatever it takes to get you from seeing only differences to seeing the similarities to the point that you recognize that there really aren't all the lines by which you and I divide ourselves from each other are imaginary. I created them myself. You created them yourself. I can wipe them away anytime that I want. And we can think of ourselves as, and there's just goofy ways of talking about this. That sounds woo woo or crazy to people, or it's what we're all the universe experience no, all, itself all, from different we're perspectives. All human. Or, I mean, yeah. The truth is we're all human. We all have the same DNA, right? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of ways to like focus on the similarities on all of the oneness. And then What's it, zero? Zero, you can't say anything about zero, right? Like that's nothing. It's, uh, like Ludwig Wittgenstein is one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century. And the last line of his most famous book, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, is uh, about which one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And he just ends the book with like a mic drop. Like, okay, so I had more to say, but you can't actually say anything about zero, You can't actually say anything about God because it's an ultimate mystery. Everything that I'm saying about it now is inadequate to convey the meaning of what's on the other side of 
from the the imaginary line between one and zero. So what, you know, what is zero? I can't talk about it. I can try. I can say a bunch of stuff and it'll point you in that direction to some degree, but kind of going zero or the zero with a thousand faces is my way of talking about that ultimate mystery is nothing. It's everything and nothing. Everything and it's the infinite nothing infinite zero like i play around with a whole bunch of like the ways that you can try to talk about that in like chapter zero which is supposed to like loosen up your worldview and get you open up to like the possibility you might be wrong about a few things or whatever also like going zero is also kind of i'm done talking about this shit watch me yeah. watch what it looks like to yeah. live out of this it's place your, of, your of love of and zero. fearlessness yeah, right and that's your version of zero right right yeah spit on your hands <laughs> and get to work is zero <laughs> at some level right uh, so I, I'm sure people listening are like, what the fuck are they talking about? But <laughs> yeah, I know we're talking off, about. Off, we're, no, we're right. We're yeah, on yeah. though. Yeah, we're, okay. we're, as much as we are off, we're on because, because genuinely the anti-hero's journey and what you talk about is how you've healed or how you've, I guess I wouldn't say healed because I think mental, mental health and wellness, you know, there is uh there is no destination. It's constant work. Yeah, it's healing. It, it's healing. Right. And so you've learned the path of the assisted therapies through psychedelics and how that's been able to be therapeutic and, and work wonders for you and thousands of others. Yeah. Yeah. And so I find it, which is, which is interesting because you'll find people who on social media, <laughs> they're experts, I guess, will say that there is no way of healing their post-traumatic stress. I'm like, well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, so it depends on the definitions of healing. We can get real clinical real fast. If you want to talk about like the, the studies or the science around MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD, like there's really good clinical trials when we've got data around putting people into what we call remission where you're below the diagnostic threshold for PTSD. You were maxing out the scores. You had chronic treatment resistant PTSD symptoms, tried all the things that are available and it doesn't work. And in the MDMA trials run by MAPS, they do three medicine sessions with preparation and integration around those, which takes about 42 hours of talk therapy around these three medicine sessions with two therapists. It takes, you know, around three months to go through the process. At the end of three months, two thirds of the participants in the study no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. That's 67% that are put into remission. And that remission is durable. That's the big difference is, uh, you know, people are put into remission and then no further they take medicine three times, they do therapy, and then 12 months later, same level of remission. Like their scores are like four or five on the standardized scales, right? Right. What, wouldn't it, so like, so say this, say I'm driving and um, I don't know, my, my, my daughter did this to me when she popped a fucking bottle behind my head. And I was like, God <laughs> yeah. damn it. I yeah, said, yeah, you yeah. about fucking, yeah. cu- right. I about ran this whole car off the road. Right. I said, they don't fucking do that shit, dude. They <laughs> fucked me up. You yeah. scared the fuck Yeah, out. for the rest of the day yeah, maybe, for some, right? Yeah, for yeah. some reason, I genuinely thought like, oh, I got shot. <laughs> you know, for a second. I was like, oh my God. And I try to explain her like, don't do that. And she's like, well, what's what's up with that? Later on, I explained her. I was like, look, I, I I have a little bit of post traumatic stress, but really, it's like I'm hyper vigilant and and very on edge about things that explode real quick in a vehicle because because experiences in combat, right? And that is a uh, my body had a physiological uh, effect to that. And what I try to get to is a place where those things don't happen as severe. Right, I'm trying to manage the, that physiological, the breathing, the 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 tenseness, the, the hypervigilance, and, yeah, right? Yeah. All those things. And so I try to explain, like, if I can get myself in a place where those scenarios don't affect me as as hard as that did, well, then I'm healing it. I'm working on. It. I'm managing. I have a manageable level of of my experiences. But forever, I will always be hyper vigilant in a sense in certain certain atmospheres, right? And so if maybe. all of a sudden I see, maybe, maybe. I, I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm I'm engaged all the time. If if there's like a fight in a big scenario, I'm like, oh, boom, 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 got to move. Yeah, you're never going to remove your amygdala, right? right? Which is kind of the epicenter of the fear the fight, circuitry fight. in your brain where, yeah, you kick down into uh, fear fight or freeze fight flight in your autonomic nervous system. And it's kind of automatic at that point. We call it the, like the monkey mind, right? Like we're going to survive. We're going to smash everything and we're going to eat it if, if it's edible afterward or whatever, right? Like <laughs> you drop down into that. But that's the thing about the way that MDMA works pharmacologically in the brain can rewire some of that stuff. It's not going to like 
excise your amygdala, right. but the way that it works is it, it, you know, like to oversimplify, it turns down the volume on the fear circuitry and it turns up the volume on all of the love and connection circuitry. So like dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine go up through the roof. <clears throat> uh, amygdala activity goes down, excuse me. <clears throat> and then there's a release of uh, a neurohormone called oxytocin which is, you know, like the, the love drug or whatever, like to levels where like the last time you had oxytocin at this level was whenever you were a little kid and, you know, pair bonding with your mother yeah. uh, is like what oxytocin gets turned up to whenever you're in an MDMA session, right? You do enough of those. And it's not that like the amygdala disappears. It's that PTSD is first a problem of overlearning a particular memory, like your brain learns that memory and wires it in, in a way that things that are unrelated to it now to carry that message through the relay circuitry, it runs through that trauma, yeah. right? Like it's like, Oh, a car backfires. And now that's got to run through some bad shit that happened to me downrange or whatever. Right. It got wired in that particular way. You overlearn that memory and then you eliminate memories on a regular basis, right? Like you don't remember what you had for lunch a month ago on this day or whatever you it's a, f a failure of what they call memory extinction. So you overlearn it in the first place and there's the potential to extinguish it anyway. And then you don't, the brain hangs on to that memory. And now you're just sending relays that are normal everyday relays. Now you, um, one of the things that all of the psychedelics do is upregulate what are called neuroplastogens or like miracle growth for your brain, like brain derived neurotrophic factor. And yeah, those sorts I have the neurotrophics right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And, uh, you know, functional mushrooms, you don't have to go like, yeah, like, crazy uh, on it. like what's there's that a ton one? of this Lion, stuff. Lion's mane. Lion's mane and turkey tail. And there's mm. a whole bunch of them. Like I have, uh, I thought about starting to grow that shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and you know, you can grow mushrooms grow everywhere, man. Like yeah. they're everywhere. I've seen people grow literally growing, every dude, time. Some kid that had like right. a, like a $9 million fucking 22 <laughs> year old kid, $9 million for yeah, psychedelic. Yeah. Well, I was like, damn yeah. bro. I mean, it grows in the dirt. How's it illegal? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's got to make their money, bro. <laughs> so all these psychoplastogens, neuroplastogens go up real high, right? And that gives you the opportunity, neurons that fire together, wire together, Hebb's axiom is uh, kind of a basic understanding of neurobiology. Now you have the opportunity to go visit those traumatic memories and wire them in to a broader network and to build essentially highways around the amygdala for the sorts of things that would usually run through a fear circuit for you. So you can make biological changes. So that's why I say maybe whenever yeah, you say you're like, right, you're right. like you can change the way that your brain is wired together so that it is possible for you to experience those things in a way that maybe you did whenever you were a teenager before you ever had to, you know, do any of the shit that you had to do. But does that scare me to not, uh, maybe I won't be ready to fight if I need to be? Right. That's the first thought everybody has too, is like, well then, you know, like if we give MDMA to soldiers, they're not going to want to deploy ever again or whatever. And you're not removing the fear circuitry. You're just removing all of the ways that it's dysfunctional in this particular setting, right? When you need it, it's still there. You have to. Yeah, like, your body goes right yeah, to it. You know, it would take you know, millions of years of evolution to remove it. Right. Or maybe like CRISPR babies, we could yeah. start playing around with like, that's a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> like removing somebody's fear circuit in the world that we live in right now, bad idea, but like, think about it. So even just as a thought experiment, it, imagine every baby born today and going forward, uh, for generations, trauma just stopped. Yeah. Like every, every, they just had peaceful lives the same way that we made an amygdala in the first place through seen evolution, movie. right? Yeah. There's a movie. That, <laughs> Is there? Yeah. What? So there's a movie called, I believe it's called The Giver. Uh, and, okay. And everyone was born without a portion of their brain that that gives them these emotions, connections, right? And so um, they're in the movie, they film it black and white. And, and eventually... This, this one kid is given the memories of life and so that he knows he holds memories of, of why they're like they are today. Essentially, he holds the, the key to why we don't give people the memories because of trauma, pain, pain, death, all these things. So now people don't feel uh, that. And so their world is black and white and his is color. And he starts seeing color. He's like, uh, wow, I might have pain, but I get to live the full version. The of whole life. spectrum of human experience. Right. So, yeah. So Which is integrating it all. Right. right? And yeah. so which is kind of kind of a cool saying of like now it's like well if we if we try and take that away from people they ever get the full experience of what life should be right which is 
like that's a question of time, right? Because we're born here at this time, we think it's super useful to be able to like fucking kill somebody. But if we were born <laughs> two million years in the future and we had stopped killing each other yeah. a million years ago, we would be looking back at like fossils like these pieces of shit were super fucking they violent. Were Why were they like that, right? Like it's just a lack of imagination. Yeah. Like and sure, you know, it's a big jump. A million years is a lot of time and like changing your brain chemistry or whatever. But that's what we all want at the end of the day, right? You want world peace. You know, like you just want to be happy in our own little yeah. worlds. Yeah. Like you just want to be free and to enjoy the relationships that you have and not have to live out of fear and just be able to trust that like if you need it, it's there, right? Because there's still like natural disasters that are going to happen, right? You're not going to eliminate. Right. Even if we ended all wars tomorrow, like volcanoes are still going to erupt. There's still yeah. things to be afraid of, right? It's just a thought experiment. But like you could rewire your brain significantly a whole bunch of different ways so that you don't have to suffer the way that you are suffering from post-traumatic stress. Yeah. Crazy. I love it. It's, it's a fascinating topic, and it's something like, I want to come to one of your clinics and do ketamine. Uh, I know for for those who are listening, I know we have probably a little bit of time left, I don't care, but um, those who are listening who might have you know their ideas of what ketamine is and fears of ketamine, uh, can you explain what one session of ketamine therapy would be? And, you know, the, I guess the the you know the lack of understanding ketamine why why is ketamine probably the first step into going even deeper into you know maybe plant medicine or other psychedelics yeah for sure uh, that's a great question um and i go into it some in the book too like ketamine in particular because ketamine's on the world health organization's essential medicines list because it's an fda approved anesthetic so if you are a little kid you break a bone you go to the emergency room we need to make you go night night while we put a cast on it you're getting a high dose of ketamine if you're a real old person and you're getting a colonoscopy probably getting a high dose of ketamine right because it's such a safe medicine it doesn't have a whole lot of effect on cardiorespiratory drive you keep breathing your heart keeps pumping which wasn't the case the whole bunch of the anesthesia that we came up with before this it was a the result of what was called the ideal anesthetic research trial was um because ketamine is so safe in terms of medical um adverse reactions that's why it's considered the ideal anesthetic we learn about it at point of wounding care in like uh, tactical combat casualty care courses and uh, in the military and in police, fire, EMS, all of that. Um, we use it at high doses to put people to sleep to take out their appendix. You can use it at super low doses for analgesia just to take away pain. It's got pain relieving qualities. And then there's this kind of in between space that we call sub anesthetic dosing that gets used in psychiatry to kind of create a non ordinary state of consciousness. So you're awake and not awake like a you're, meditative state almost exa yeah exactly like you're in this dimension and not in this dimension or whatever it is right and it's unique to everybody to themselves um their experience there right the way that ketamine works in the brain it's got a whole bunch of different mechanisms of action that we don't necessarily have to go into but what it does uh it has a really short half-life in the body which means it's about five and a half half lives in the body before the medicine's gone and ketamines is 15 minutes. So within like an hour, it's out of your system. If you get it um, through IM, an intramuscular injection or an IV infusion, it goes, you know, straight into the bloodstream. It's bypassing the liver. So the metabolism winds up getting straight into your brain and doing its job. And then a session is usually the medicine portion of a session is usually like 40 to 45 minutes long. And by an hour going by, you're back at what we call new baseline. So you just had an experience that was unique to you and completely unpredictable. You might be back in the worst memory of your entire life. Or I got one guy who would, would just be like in the chair yelling, I'm 10,000 trapezoids on the floor right now. And I don't know what that means, but like, I'd like to get on that level someday <laughs> or whatever. Sounds dope, you know? Yeah. It's super unique to each individual. And you have this quote unquote psychedelic experience wow. where so you, you open up. But it's super short. It's super low risk. Like there isn't even a reversal agent for ketamine. Like it's just time. Like, yeah. okay, you're having a bad time. Wait 15 minutes and it's gone. Right. Get yeah. It. So, so that's why it's a safe one to start with in a bunch of done, ways. I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this. So have you done other psychedelics? I don't know if you're allowed to ask that. And I don't know if I'm allowed to answer that. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds too easy. Um, you know, I guess I guess people who are probably listening and seeing how different this is from other plant medicine, but I think every experience in psychedelics is is everyone everyone's experience. It's slightly different. Um, 
it's crazy to me to hear that people are talking while doing it. And I guess because they're in a therapy session, they're they're I guess emoting or or, or expressing anything they see. Yeah. Is that what it is? Because yeah. I I imagine like if you're in a trip, you're just sitting there like zonk, zonked out. But I don't know. There's a lot of similarities and differences. Like people compare trip reports, and there's like whole websites online of people. You know, like there's Reddit's and subreddits all about like whatever you saw in the K hole or whatever you saw and you know mushrooms. K holes. Is that yeah, they call it K hole. Yeah, like if you turn the dose up too far and you get stuck somewhere, you get stuck in hell. Then yeah, they call it the K hole or whatever because you feel like you're just getting recycled and you can't get back out. And you're just so with that same. You're question, still conscious, but yeah. you, it's like an anesthetic dose that's just a little bit too low like if you were getting surgery you'd be having a real bad time because you're awake oh, enough fuck. or if you're like it's like when in you psychiatry say, you went too feel high it, but they're out yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah that's not where you want to be so there's you know people that probably be scared to do something like this anytime you mention psychedelics they're like oh no i've heard friends who gone too far and they've changed forever you know that i hear that a lot i don't know if that's ever, ever fucking true um but there's people who say like, yeah, man, it's not good for you. You'll fuck it. It'll fuck you up forever. Or, you know, is that is there ever in psychedelics a possibility of that happening? I don't know. I, it, yeah, I mean, nothing's a zero risk, right? Like, there's the risk of, um, you know, you. Yeah, there's adverse reactions to like anything that you put in your mouth. Like you can be allergic to it. You can have a bad time on whatever you can overdose on whatever. Right. And yes, the way that they work in your brain for like rewiring some things are going to make some changes. Hopefully those are positive changes, which is why we want to do a lot of this stuff in a therapeutic context. But yeah, there are people who also get brought into the emergency room because they think they're living in hell now and like the people that they're with can't manage that or whatever right which is why it makes sense like there's kind of three routes to gaining access to these things right <laughs> now you scared the fuck out of there's, me there's there's <laughs> there's the clinical route right like we clinicalize we medicalize it right and we have professionals who are highly trained like me right. to prescribe the medicine and to provide the appropriate support of a hospital or a clinic or do the therapy around these sorts of things then there's legalization which is just hey you can buy this stuff somewhere colorado's gone that route with proposition 122 that they passed last november two novembers ago uh where you know like you can grow mushrooms yourself out there and you can take mushrooms and you can it's all legal like i was out at psychedelic science convention convention uh for maps it's their annual conference like repping my book in a deadpool costume or whatever goofing off yeah. but there were people in the convention center who had permits denver had decriminalized that's the third route is decriminalization psilocybin and they were just passing out chocolate bars with psilocybin mushrooms in them like somebody wanted to take a picture of me with me in the deadpool costume and then like gave me five grams of psilocybin i was like I don't know what I'm supposed to fucking do with this. Like you're supposed to eat it, bro. Like I'm not eating this like here. I just pass it on or whatever. So it could be legal in different places. And then there's decrim, which is just, you can grow it yourself. You can have it yourself. Like it grows in the dirt man or whatever. Right. You, the safest route, right. Is obviously medicalization where you have a whole lot of support around somebody for the most part. Then there's, there's also kind of the ceremonial space, which you've kind of talked about some, yeah. uh, having some experience with. Yeah. The and natives do a lot of that. All of these are medicines. They're quote unquote plant medicines that have belonged to indigenous peoples all over the planet for centuries. And it's just in the last, you know, century or so that we colonized a whole bunch of that stuff. And that's, you know, a controversial thing. Like who do these belong to in the first place? They grow in the dirt. They belong to the people that live on the dirt. Can you even own dirt in the first place is kind of a controversial concept at that point, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of us here in America think we own a whole bunch of dirt but then wind up six <laughs> feet under it real real quick after that and god kind of laughs right um like what what's the the ceremonial approach right you you've talked about um you know like curious about ayahuasca right or uh you know uh dmt yeah all mm -hmm. of these medicines have ceremonial and ritual traditions that go back as far as anybody has memory coming back around to like the religious question they're tied into a whole bunch of religious practices of indigenous peoples all over the planet right so you know there's medicalization there's legalization there's decriminalization and there's also the ceremonial and ritual space that uh, we ought to be honoring a whole lot better than we yeah. do and how do you approach those legally and yeah we did that during our light the fuse we did non-psychedelic uh, plant medicine we did um hape sanangra i believe i'm saying it right and then uh combo and i didn't do combo because i didn't get medically cleared for that this time but um all of those are non-psychedelic but still it 
create an experience, right? Sure. Yeah. And uh, it's done in ceremonial. I think the ceremony itself is what part of the experience would be, you know, yeah. like respecting the medicine as well as in, in having intention with the medicine. And I think that is probably the safest way of doing it is having real intention and not just trying to go deep into something, you know, but having a purpose for what you're doing. Yeah, that's the that's the key. One of the cornerstones of psychedelic assisted therapy is this concept of set and setting. The <laughs> The mindset with which you go into these experiences is key. And then the setting in which that's taking place and they interplay with each other all the time, right? If you know you're in a safe place with safe people who can take care of you, who are going to be therapeutic and caring, that affects your mindset. You feel safe. So you feel brave. You feel like you can take on a demon that you see or, you know, whatever the case might be. And I don't want to like, uh, overplay my experience of like seeing demons and having a terrible no. time, right? Like there's plenty of people who go in into these spaces and they just have uh like they're like dream states right like they're back in their mother's arms whenever they were a kid and they really like are grieving the loss of their mother right and they have these intensely positive experiences and like i got to heaven and i had like an intensely positive experience eventually but like maybe i'm just fucked up enough that like my psyche knew that i needed to be dragged through hell for a while to kind of earn feeling good about myself or something man you know i, I don't know I, I think it's all fascinating as fuck dude um <laughs> me too yeah <laughs> like i'm making a career out of it at this point that's how fascinated i am with it right how can how can someone get a hold of you if they have more questions about this and and further kind of pursue their their i guess their path to enlightenment yeah the you know the easiest way is just my website antiheroesjourney.com that's where i'm selling my audiobook and my ebook and i did like a video take of it and um you know you can fill out the uh, form on there if you want me to like come speak or you know talk or like i'd love to get on more podcasts and get out there and just kind of spread the word because it's amazing to me because it's the world that i live in I'm talking to people, you know, other professionals about this stuff all the time. And then I go out and talk to my friends like in the guard or something. And like, nobody knows that there's the potential to be so much more healthy than you, you're what you're living down to. Right. It, and, and it's like right at the doorstep, like MDMA is supposed to get legalized next year. Maybe psilocybin right on its heels. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there, right? Sorry, I'm well, not no, answering your no, question. No, no, but, it'd but be, yeah. it's good for guys who... Law enforcement needs to be aware of this. Right. Military needs to be aware of this. Veterans need to be aware of this. But not even that, just, uh, you know, mothers who struggle with, you know, I, I've had some experiences with a lot of women who, who after having a baby, postpartum depression. Exactly. Right? Depression. Yeah. Just, I mean, the list goes, this isn't for like just the warrior. This is for the average person who is kind of stuck in a bubble in the space of like some kind of depression, anxiety. So I have an 18 year old daughter who, who, who struggles with this like deep anxiety that kind of can be de defined as also a depression. And I'm trying to get her to do to do the ketamine i said and she goes you know her, her whole thing was like it's not a drug i'm like this is a medically assisted version of that 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 can really find her answer to this like anxiety that just kind of sometimes is crippling for her you know what i mean and, and so i say that is like if you're listening to this and you have a question it, this is not just for the warrior this is not just for the law enforcement officer this is for anyone who is kind of stuck in this phase of like man i can't seem to find an answer for this feeling this depressive state this anxiety state this maybe this this hardship uh, uh, the loss of a loved one that i can't seem to break this 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 feeling of like doom and gloom or sadness this is one step in a direction that maybe is not orthodox that you, which you've been told left and right from friends or whatever, or from other doctors. And this is not the extreme of going down plant medicine, ayahuasca that a lot of us talk about. Sometimes you've probably heard on other podcasts. This is kind of like the first step into that direction that is medically assisted with, with doctors and, and, you know, physicians who, who are trained heavily in this space. This is really a good answer. I've had a lot of friends who've gone this route. And this is just opening that door to hopefully healing these deep, deep um, depressive states and anxiety states and, and these these phases of like when you lose loved ones, sometimes it's hard to dig yourself out of. And this is one of those things that I've seen work. And I personally am going to experience myself. Yeah. I I, I want to emphasize that it's ketamine assisted therapy, that it's therapy first, therapy throughout, therapy afterwards. At the clinic that I own in, just outside Louisville, I don't 
do that solo at all. Like you, it's on a referral basis only. You can't walk in, you can't self refer. You need to be in therapy with a therapist already. I'm not a therapist. I'm a physician assistant, right? And nobody knows what the difference is. Nobody right. cares, but I only work collaboratively in that clinic. You have to already have a prescriber already be under somebody's care. And then I'm augmenting what they do with ketamine assisted therapy because I'm good at that particular modality of therapy. Now, the other clinic that I work at in Kentucky is called Expedition Mental Health and expeditionmentalhealth.com is where you can go. And that's more of an integrative psychiatry practice where like we provide everything. And one of my collaborating physicians, Dr. Kristen Dawson, is a double board certified child and adult psychiatrist, used to be on UK faculty. I, I tell everybody she's the best psychiatrist on the planet. She's the nicest person. She's a really good friend of mine. I'm blessed to be able to be working in my own space and then to partner with her uh, in Lexington. Um, to be able to do some of those sorts of things, but we are very therapy first therapy throughout. That's the key because it's not just taking ketamine, right? Like ketamine is also a drug of abuse. Like you can buy ketamine out on the street yeah. and you can take it and Special K. not get, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And not get any better at all. Right. Like you may have a good time or well, something, same with whatever, mushrooms. you know, but same with mushrooms. Yeah, exactly. Like you can take this stuff for different intentions with different mindsets and different settings. But if what you're doing is trying to, address a mental health concern of some kind you need to already be in therapy and augment it with some of these medicines it's a deeper the conversation around. that not everyone listening will understand but the medicine the, the medicine is special right and, and it has its own spirit essentially and it has its own energy and so you have to respect that and uh, when you start to understand that well then you see it differently exactly yeah and you got to get on it's one of those things right like if you know you know once you're in you see like oh Oh, this is what they were talking about all that time, right? Same thing with like zero. Oh, it's a big mystery that you can't say anything about, but you can experience it, right? You can have the experience and then you know, and then you just kind of like make up your own way of like, everything was like Legos for a while or like, you know, you find your way of talking about it, but you recognize that all words are hollow tools for trying to convey the significance of the experience that you just had. Love it, dude. That camera right there, go ahead and plug your book as well as your social media. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on all of the social medias at Doc Askins for Facebook and TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and whatever else is out there on uh, LinkedIn. You look me up, it's uh, Doc Askins. My website is antiheroesjourney.com. You just click download the journey now and you can get a bundled uh, audiobook, ebook uh, available for over half off. No coupon codes needed. I just knocked half off for the rest of the year because it's Christmas time time. Um, if you want to, you know, look up the clinics, expeditionmentalhealth.com in Lexington. And then I don't even have a website because I work on a referral basis only in Louisville. And then I also work at wild health. You can go to wildhealth.com. That's primary care and health coaching and like some of the genomics based precision medicine that we didn't really get to talk yeah, we, about. We had to do another session on that uh, one. A fellowship and training on all of that. And you can get 20% off at wildhealth.com on your first year membership with the code, just all caps doc D O C. And it is medicine 3.0, 3.5, 4.0, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's trying to do the best possible care for patients that you could ever imagine. It's like the sort of medicine that's available only to the richest 1% we're working to bring to everybody. We're trying to figure out how to solve for all of that stuff with insurance, with all of those sorts of things. Super genius doctors who are my friends, who I'm very fortunate to even be associated with, run all of that sort of stuff. So wildhealth.com, expeditionmentalhealth.com, and then antiheroesjourney.com for all of my personal brand stuff, whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. I got, I'm going to get you a bag full of stuff. Uh, we got some, some nootropics. I got a light the fuse, uh, water, a water jug and a few other things. So a book of a range, another range of my buddy of mine wrote and stuff. But, um, we want to talk, we got a nonprofit that, that we can, if we can, if we need to, we can use to help guys get blood work at okay. your place. So we can yeah, talk about that. Yeah, later. yeah, really we can cool. figure that out. Uh, I guess go for it. That's one other thing is I've partnered with uh, the Sherrard Institute, and I'm going to be putting uh, their sponsors for my podcast. And we're they're a 501 c three. And for the end of the year here, I'm going to try to figure out how to way a way for people to donate to the Sherrard Institute in my name, and then every dollar that they donate is just going to go directly to care for the underserved, like the people who can afford this therapy the least uh, are the ones who need it the most. And I'm going to try to bridge the gap through collecting donations through the Beautiful. Sherrard Institute. Let me know. And we'll, we'll, if you make a post like that, I'll share it on my page. That's cool. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Just want to give a shout out to my podcast first. Uh, the 
anti-heroes journey. Go check this out. I'm super pumped to have this. Uh, there's a lot more conversations we have to have, and I'm excited. We're going we're gonna to do this again because we're going to dig deeper into some of the psychedelics. Once I go do uh, a therapy session with you guys, I, I want to kind of talk about it more. We'll do like a that'd be awesome. Uh, like an, a live there or something session after the whole process is done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my sponsors, don't forget, Core Medical Group, uh, you can go get your hormones checked. I promise you, you need to go do that. Go get your blood work done. Go let them know that the Vinnie Rock Podcast sent you. Uh, if you're a man, if you're a woman, some people don't know that, but women need it too. So go check that out. Modern Gun School is an online gun company. You can, you can, It's a gun education school, essentially. You can use your VA, lo- uh, your VA benefits. You can use your Vogue Rehab. Uh, they'll pay for you to go get your armor certification, and you do it at the comfort of your own home. They send you all the tools. I'm going to get one sent to me so you guys can kind of see what it looks like. GMR Gold and Bullion Box. Go get yourself a Bullion Box now. It is a subscription-based uh, it's a subscription based model where you can get your gold and precious metals. If you guys didn't see metals are through the roof right now, gold is blowing the fuck up. So you heard it here first, go get some GMR gold, go get a bullion box subscription. Uh, what I have another sponsor. I'm really terrible at this. GMR gold, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my butt kicked. Uh, Modern Gun School, yes. Core Medical, yes. Uh, GMR Gold, yes. And I know there's another one that I'm going to have to do a personal. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for it. Either way. Hey, I love you guys. Thank you very much. Don't forget to go check out my book. Uh, I have it here, Borderline, as well as go check out some veteran gear. And uh, on Wednesday nights, we do a live men's call. You check it out. If you guys like it, like and subscribe my YouTube channel. We're trying to grow those. And uh, go check out my partner here. He's, he's a fucking badass. Thank you very much.